All right, if you've been with us, you know that we've been walking through this series, Is God? Today we're looking at, as you can see, Is God Compassionate? Now you might think, well, yes, he is, of course. Let's go to lunch. But what this means is um, compassion really literally means suffer with. That's what it means. The etymology of the word, is he with me? Is he, is he, does he feel with me? Another way to ask this question today, is he aware? This is a great question for moms who ask this all the time. And, and not to stereotype too much, but in the midst of, of mounds of laundries, long days with babies, maybe sleepless, no, sleepless nights, feeding children on days when you just wish you could kind of talk to an adult, right? When Bluey is your favorite television show and, um, and Miss Rachel becomes your best friend. Um, it can be long. Again, we say, you know, the, the days are long, the years are short. And we can wonder, does God even see me? Does he understand what I'm going through? And some of us today, through, through loss, through pain, maybe even today, a loss of a spouse, loss of a husband, loss of a wife, infertility, all that comes together on a day like this. There's a single book in the Bible that addresses all of this. It's the book of Ruth. And I don't know if you have ever read the book of Ruth, but this is your day. We're going to read the entire book. It takes about 15 minutes. I'm going to step up and down between chapters to give a little commentary. And we're going to let the story speak for itself. It is an amazing story. And you're going to identify with someone in the story. So I want you to grab your Bible right now. You'll have one in front of you there. We're not going to have the scripture on the screen. If you would like or prefer to, um, have it open and just listen if you want to do that. I have some readers who are helping me out today. Uh, Amay McClanahan is going to be our narrator. She has the bulk of the reading as she reads God's word to us. And it's straight all this, straight from God's word. We have Burdell Kreischer, who's Naomi today, appropriately, godly woman among us. Uh, and gosh, an influence for, for so many of us. Bailey DeJean will be Ruth and then uh, Chip Wagner will be Boaz, all right? Because you have to say his name kind of like that, Boaz, here he is. All right, so let's dive in. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Kilion died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go. Return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. 
Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her, and she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has done very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. All right, so there's famine in the land. Uh, these Israelites leave to go to the land of Moab. This is the, the Moabites are the ancient enemies of Israel. It's noteworthy. This place, if you've been to the Holy Land, it's east of the Dead Sea. So they go from Israel over what's now currently Jordan. And, and they, they are there because there's a famine in the land, but they hear there's food there. Okay. Now, when the, it sounds like the, the famine is, is, has been uh, removed, essentially, it's things are going better over in Israel. They start to head back. So you're tracking that. The two of them, Orpah decides, no, I'm going to stay among my people after Naomi really pleads with them. This is noteworthy. We've got a cultural historical bridge to gap, uh, to, to bridge here, a gap for in our, in our understanding. And it's this, that, that a woman, okay, in this culture, highly patriarchal culture, uh, and, and a, a single woman is really in trouble. Now, a woman who's old, older and can no longer have children is really in trouble. Naomi has no options here. She decides, I'm going to go back to Israel, extended family, ancestors and such. Maybe there'd be some care for me. But a woman who is no longer uh, child you know, bearing years is really in trouble. Ruth, as you saw, clings to her. And then it's in verse 16 that, that those verses you read sometimes in a wedding, where you lodge, I will lodge. Where you go, I will go. And then she says this, she says, your God, this is noteworthy, your God will be my God. This is a Moabite, now who's been evangelized, if you will, because of Naomi's great love, her mother-in-law. She says, I want your God. Oh, that we would live that way, right? That I want your God. And so she then says, uh, and may the Lord deal with me however he wants to, uh, that I'll never be separated from him. I will die. Wherever you are, I will stay with you until I die, is what she's saying. And she uses the name Yahweh. This is significant. The Lord, the specific personal God of the Israelites, okay? So Ruth, watch this. She's racial, racially marginalized. She's an immigrant in another place. She's extremely vulnerable. In fact, there are laws that cover uh, women like this, and even the Torah offers help for women like this. Naomi shows up, and they say, it's Naomi. And she says, no, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant, by the way. Call me bitter, because my life is a mess, and I am bitter, and I am sad, and I am grieving. Then chapter 1, you saw, um, ends with, it's the beginning of the barley harvest. This is noteworthy as well, because again, a cultural historical leap in Leviticus 19, among other places, we see um, that provisions are made for those who are immigrants, that the poor are able to glean or at least to pick from the outside you know, skirts of a, uh, of a field. And so we're going to see that come into play a little bit. But don't miss this. For Ruth to go out and now even enter the workforce is a dangerous thing for her to do. She's a Moabite. 
She's in a different land, another place. She is risking her life. She is courageous and bold, but she's going to need someone in some position of influence and power to extend grace to her to help. Let's see what happens. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now, listen, my daughter, do not glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field they are reaping, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people you didn't know before? The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes. My Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here, eat some bread, and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her, and also pull some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, And she also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I worked today was Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forgotten the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth, the Moabite, said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Wow, a twist in the story. Not only did she meet Boaz, they discover that, wait, he is one of their relatives, at least Naomi's relatives, right? 
So because of his great generosity, we start to see Boaz extending his grace to Ruth and to the family, and Naomi's blessed as well. In verse 20, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Here we're introduced to, to the provision of the kinsman redeemer. Okay, again, cultural leap for us. This is the closest male relative who would take on the, uh, the, the woman who's left with the deceased husband. Okay, you've heard of the leveret we've talked about recently, a leveret marriage where um, a brother would actually, if a brother died and he has a, he has a brother, the brother would then marry, take in his, his sister-in-law. Now, it sounds strange to us, and it is, but what's happening here, it's all about the family, even more so than in our day. Everything, even, the, even Boaz is just being a Torah observant Jew, and what he's doing is seeking to help the family because it's all about the family, all about the family name, and yes, it's a lot about males being born and sons because you have this great cheap workforce and you can amass a family business. So that's what's happening here. Um, but if you have no brother, and clearly there's not, then what are your options? Closest relative to come into play. But Ruth still, I mean, Naomi in particular, has no options. She is in a really difficult spot. At the beginning of, of chapter two, now we'll see at the beginning of chapter three, Ruth and Naomi are concocting a plan. At the end of each chapter, they then celebrate, yes, 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 God is at work among us. So she's gonna tell her, you're gonna hear in chapter three, hey, Naomi says to Ruth, hey, wash your face, anoint yourself. She's saying, stop grieving. You need, to, you need to now let, here's what she's doing. Let men, how about Boaz, know that you're available. Watch this. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with your soul? Is not Boaz our relative, and whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go, and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, 
for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Okay, awkward. Was it not? Again, a little cultural uh, leap here to help us um, for a moment, but this is like another cultural colloquialism. What is it that she, she, she you know, takes the blanket off of his feet? Some commentators have noted it. Well, as the temperature drops through the night, it's going to wake him up. And then and she wants to be seen. She wants to be found. But she didn't want to startle him. So she's laying there. And y'all, okay, women, listen, young women in particular. Well, all age women. This is descriptive, not prescriptive. You tracking with me? Um, this, but what she is doing, don't miss this, where it says, um, verse 9, she asked him to spread his wings over her, bring all of his covering and protection over her, is what she's saying. She's asking him to marry her. This is bold on the part of Ruth, right? And again, some of you girls are like, yeah, if he's not going to, I need to make the move, perhaps. Maybe that's the case. But in verse 11, Boaz calls her a woman of noble character, a worthy woman. That's the same phrase that's used in, in Proverbs 31 to describe the, the P31 woman. Okay, And he's already been described as this, a man of great generosity, great character, Torah observant Jews, obeying the Lord. And in verse 16, Naomi asked, well, how did you fare? And Ruth essentially, with all of her evidence and such, she says, he said yes. And so now we're seeing the, the plot thicken because what is up with this other redeemer? How's this going to end? Let's listen. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. And also Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephatha and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, 
Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amminadab. Amminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Wow. Thanks, Amay. What a story. Hey, let's thank all of our readers for helping us uh, here. Thank you so much. Okay, in the latter part there of chapter four, Boaz is brilliant in how he presents this to the kinsman redeemer. Did you catch this? At first he says, hey, we got this land. Here's what's up. You're the guy. And he says, hey, more land for me. If he has the, the ability and the willingness to do so, he says, yes, let's go. I'll take it. Then Boaz adds that, hey, well, there's also Ruth that comes into play. We got a Moabite woman that you're going to take on as well. He's caring for her even still. The guy says, I'm out. I'm not going to do that for various reasons. Maybe he thought I'm not going to care for someone who's outside of my people, right? But this, the grace that Boaz is offering here, this, this barrier breaking power of grace, he's welcoming in a woman who's an, who's an immigrant, who is not formal, not, not a racial, right? Hebrew, not a, not a Jewish person. He's making not only provision for her, he's making provision for Naomi because the name that will continue on is Elimelech. It's his name that will be passed on. And I want you to see there's several applications here as we close, as we always seek to apply scripture. If we just look at this and say, wow, the integrity of Boaz, or wow, the boldness of Ruth, and look at the faithfulness of Naomi through time and decades. Yes, that's powerful. This story is about so much more than that. If I were to tell you, all moms and everybody here today, hey, go work harder, get better. Come on, be, be this way, live like this. Good luck with that, right? Without the hope that this story points us to. Because there are four redeemers in this story. Have you caught him? One is clear, Boaz is clear, the, the redeemer, okay? A prototype of a redeemer to come. The second one, there's the other, other redeemer, but he, he opts out, so he's gone. So there's essentially three redeemers. Boaz, man of integrity who steps in, and many of us can do that with people around us, and be the bridge builder. All of us can serve like Boaz. Be that bridge of grace into the family of God. But watch this, Ruth is a redeemer. Ruth is used by God as an agent to care for the older Naomi, to care for a family member. How is every life in this story changed? It's the power of relationship. That's what it is. And on a day where we focus in on family, oftentimes we have estranged families, family members. We have challenges in our homes, we all do. And notice that it says in, uh, in chapter four, verse 15, a spirit, I can say it this way, spiritual friendship, the power of grace giving friends is better than seven sons. Another little colloquialism, better than a perfect family. That's what that's saying. Because no one has a perfect family. God's grace through the gospel of Jesus is better than all that we've lost in our families. He's better than anything that, that we grieve in the past. We can cling to him. Watch this. He's better than marriage. 
He's better than a family. He's better than having sons or daughters. It, what, what the, the, the third one, the fourth redeemer that this is pointing to is Jesus Christ. The entire story here is the faithfulness of people through great loss and grief and the daily grind of life to see that my little story makes a difference. My faithfulness today and tomorrow on a Monday morning, caring for a child or a grandchild, perhaps on a Tuesday afternoon, or just showing up faithfully at work, bridging the gap for others who do not know the Lord, inviting them in. All of this points to the Savior. Did you catch it? Many wonder, why is the book of Ruth even in, this, in, in the canon of Scripture? And something, I mean, hardly the name of God is even mentioned. And yet, this is the brilliance of the story. Like your life, God is at work throughout the entire story. It's as if there's a stage with two lights. Over here we see this, the book of Job plays this way. Here is your life plays out this way. Here's what we see. Here's what's happening. Naomi, Ruth, ah, Boaz steps in. And then over here we have God who's directing everything that's happen, happening. Friends, listen, he is sovereign over your life. He sees you. He is for you. He is compassionate with you. He feels with you. You are not alone. And you need to know that your small moves of faithfulness, God is working in your little story, your seeming little, little story. And we are here for a moment in time. But he's at work because this story goes all the way to Obed, who then uh, had the son named Jesse, who had a son named David. David's not the ultimate redeemer. David's here for a moment. Yes, during the golden ages of, of Israel's history, but he spins out. He even flames out, you could say. Because it all points us. Every book of the Bible points us to Jesus. The book of Judges closes out with the people had no king and everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes. Sounds a lot like this cultural moment. Ruth bridges the gap is used by God so that her name is in the genealogy in Matthew 1. That's how God is at work, and he's at work in your life. Some of us need to take on the boldness of Ruth. We need to decide, I will stop grieving the past. It's time for me to move on. Can I say it to all of us, men included? Whatever your past has been, wash your face. Ha, don't put on makeup. Um, do, you know, fix yourself up, anoint yourself, commit yourself to the Lord because he's not done with you. As long as you have breath, he's not done with you. And even on this day, we are, we are thinking about Pike Peterson, who's is clinging to life. The Lord's not done with him. He's bringing glory, all of us in prayer to pray over the Peterson family, a family that's grieving among us. And we've come around them and we are praying for them. I want to challenge you to do so. Whatever you're going through, here's a family whose son, 14-year-old son, is clinging to life. And we're praying for them that God would cover them. There's a purpose in it all. And Pike is being used by God and he's pointing all of us to Jesus even now. Friends, today is the day of commitment for you. That's what this story is all about. It's about us giving our lives over to the Lord. And if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's no hope for you. There are no options other than Christ coming to us. Watch this. <laughs> the first immigrant, the primary missionary, comes to us in our barren land, in the midst of famine. While we were yet sinners, Christ comes, our kinsman, Redeemer, becomes like us moves into the neighborhood, as it were, and he then says, I will care for you. I will offer protection and cover you. Even in your sin, I will take on your sin. I'll live the perfect life for you. I will die on a cross for you so that you can be covered by my grace and the protection of my love and redemption of you from the Father's wrath. That you will not experience the, the holy reaction that is right 
and good and holy from God to us if you'll receive Christ as your Savior. And friend, if you've not done that, today is your day. To receive Christ and say yes to him because then out of the riches of his grace, he provides for us all that we need, better than life itself. And he says, come. And we come to him by faith to receive and then he becomes our redeemer. Let's all pray together. How is the Lord speaking to you here? What do you need to do? Because this story is about the power of Christian friendship in the end. It's about a redeemer who has already come now to save us. So by faith, friend, if you don't know him right now, I want you to say yes to him. He's he's calling out to you. If you've never received Christ, may today be your day. Say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. And if you're here today, friends, and you don't have a friend like Naomi, wow. If you don't have a friend like Ruth, if you don't have someone in your life who can say, I am with you to the end, then you need to be proactive. You need to have the boldness of Ruth. You need to have the the generosity of Boaz to reach out to others. And here it is. Some of you need to join the fellowship of our church today. How is God speaking to you? This is what our church is all about. Spiritual friendships pointing us all to Jesus. It's about connect groups where you can find friends. Be bold. Be courageous. You cannot do this life alone. And so, Lord, we give you our lives, all of us. Give our lives to you anew today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.